Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the two, uh, 2021 thematic seminar uh, on management challenges of internationally designated areas, uh, organized by the Jeju Special Self-Governing Province, the Korean National Commission for UNESCO, and the MAP Committee of the Republic of, Republic of Korea. My name is Eun Kim, and I am Director of Sciences team at the Korean National Commission for UNESCO. It is my great honor to welcome you to, to this seminar. And I would like to express my sincere thanks to all of you for joining us uh, from all over the world for this online meeting. As you may know, the establishment of Global Research and Training Center for internationally designated areas was, uh, in Jeju Island, Republic of Korea, was endorsed at the uh, 40th session of UNESCO General Conference as a Category 2 center under the auspices of UNESCO. And I am very happy to inform you that uh, the center is planned to be open next year. This seminar is organized as a pilot activity of the center, following up on the capacity building workshop for managers of internationally designated areas. Uh, that was held in Jeju, Republic, Republic of Korea, in September 2019. I believe some of you joined that workshop. Initially, we planned to hold this seminar as a face-to-face -face meeting, too. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we are holding it online instead. It aims to provide an opportunity for managers of internationally designated areas to improve their knowledge and capacity, focusing on three challenges. First, involvement of local communities. Second, communication with the visitors and the general public. And third, ecotourism. Today, we have a keynote speech and three different case presentations on involvement of local communities, followed by a panel discussion among all pre presenters at the end. If you come up with any questions during the seminar, please leave a comment in either the Q&A tab or Zoom chat, and we will gladly discuss it at the end of the session. We will now begin the opening session. I would like to invite Mr. Moon Gyeong Sam, Director General for Environment Conservation Bureau of the Jeju Special Self-Governing Province for his welcome remarks on behalf of the organizers. Please. 아, 여러분 반갑습니다. 네, 제주도청 환경보전국장 문경삼입니다. 아, 먼저 오늘 행사를 준비해 주신 유네스코 한국위원회의 한경구 사무총장님. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. As introduced, I'm the Director General of the Environment Conservation Bureau at the Jeju Special Self-Governing Province. At the outset, my special thanks goes to Han kyung gu Secretary General of the Korean National Commission for UNESCO, and Han byung Secretary General of MAB, National Committee of the Republic of Korea. It's regretful that we couldn't meet in person, but I extend a very warm welcome to everyone here today. I'm sure this needs no reminder, but Jeju Island was designated as a UNESCO Bioreserve in 2002, a World Natural Heritage Site in 2007, received the Global Geopark Network certification in 2010, and registered five Ramsar wetland sites between 2006 and 2018. It's the only area in the world that has achieved these four accolades at the same time. This online thematic seminar aims at strengthening the management capacity required to protect and manage internationally designated areas across the world in line with their purpose of designation. In addition, the seminar is a part of a pilot project in anticipation of the internationally designated area Global Research Training Center sponsored by UNESCO that is slated to open in Jeju in 2022. As you are aware, the Internationally Designated Areas, or IDAs, Global Research Training Center was envisioned envisaged at the 2012 IUCN World Conservation Congress and by Jeju Island in partnership with IUCN, UNESCO, the Ramsar Convention, and the Ministry of Environment. 
To give you a bit of update, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is spearheading the establishment of the center and negotiations are underway. The agreement between UNESCO and the Korean government is expected to be finalized this year, and if this pans out, the center will open next year. Once the internationally designated area global research training center opens, the online workshops and training programs will provide an invaluable opportunity, especially to those overseas, so that they can gain a first-hand experience of the four major IDAs in Jeju. We look forward to your continued support and interest. Throughout our three-day long journey together, we will go over three major themes or topics, involvement of local communities, communication strategies, and ecotourism in internationally designated areas. I hope the cases and experiences that will be shared on these respective themes will go a long way in strengthening management capabilities of IDAs. In closing, I hope that this workshop serves as a venue for everyone to build friendships and keep in touch down the road in an effort to contribute to strengthening the sustainability of internationally designated areas across the globe. Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. I would like to welcome you all to this online semantic seminar on management challenges of internationally designated areas organized jointly by the Korean National Commission for UNESCO, Jeju Special Self-Governing Province, and the MAB National Committee of the Republic of Korea, in close cooperation with the Republic of Korea's Ministry of Environment and the Korean National Park Service. Internationally designated areas, which include World Heritage Sites, Biosphere Reserves, UNESCO Global Geoparks, and Ramsar sites have a growing role in achieving the sustainable development goals. As a result, managers of those areas face ever more complex challenges in how to increase the involvement of local communities, how to improve communication with the visitors and the general public, and how to promote ecotourism. Throughout the seminar, we will hear from three keynote speakers and nine case study presenters, each of whom will share their professional insights and experience in dealing with such challenges, making this seminar a valuable learning opportunity for us all. As you may already know, this seminar has been organized as a pilot project of the Global Research and Training Center for Internationally Designated Areas which will be opening in 2022 as a UNESCO Category 2 Center in Jeju. A major part of the role of the center will be to help enhance and develop capacities for the management of internationally designated areas. And I greatly hope that you will all continue to stay up to date with how the center can help in this regard and work with the center to ensure that it can help you as much as possible. I would like to end thanking each of you again for being here with us today, and I hope to see you again at a face-to-face -face seminar in the near future. Thank you, Secretary General. Now I would like to invite Dr. Natarajan Ishiwaran, our keynote speaker today. Dr. Ishwaran worked at UNESCO for almost 30 years until 2012, dealing with uh, all programs of UNESCO designated areas. Since 2012, he has been affiliated with a number of science and technology centers and academic institutions in China, collaborating with international organizations to promote earth sciences and their applications to natural and cultural heritage <coughs> management and sustainable development. Please give him a warm welcome. Hello, everyone, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm going to speak today on this uh, KNC online thematic seminar on the theme of involvement of the local community in internationally designated areas. To be its internationally designated areas will be referred to as IDAs as of now. Uh, my presentation, uh, I'm going to first uh, say something brief about the Global Research and Training Center for IDAs, which is called GCDA, and it is a UNESCO Category 2 center 
in Jeju Island, Korea. Uh, provide an overview of the four most important IDAs and their current status. Uh, present a brief overview of the evolution of local community conservation area relations in the broader context of global changes in international environment and development relations. Management challenges of IDAs, uh, particularly in uh, pre post COVID times. And some suggestions about how GCD, GCDA, the center, the Korean center could take up an international cooperation agenda on research and training on local community involvement in the management of IDAs. Now, GCDA is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a center established by the Korean government in uh, G, uh, Jeju Island. Uh, the GCDA as a center, UNESCO Category 2 center, was approved in November 2019, and we, all of us, uh, both in Korean National Commission and people like me, we had great plans for doing a lot of things in GCDA, but then came the COVID pandemic. So we haven't been able to do almost anything. This is uh, the first event I am participating after my visit to Jeju Island uh, in the, during the times of the preparation of the GCDA Center. So I hope we are going to uh, overcome this period of absence and do more continuous activities. Now, GCDA as a global center for IDAs is going to focus on four different categories of sites. Uh, the World Heritage Sites, now this uh, slide shows you the status of these sites, uh, the current numbers, the number of countries involved, etc. cetera. Uh, for World Heritage, uh, I'll be mainly dealing with the natural sites. Uh, the larger number is, uh, uh, the larger number of sites are cultural sites. Of course, some of the things I say applies to them as well, but uh, for comparison sakes, biosphere reserves, Ramsar sites, global geoparks, they are all mostly natural sites. So it is better to talk about world natural heritage rather than all of the world, all, the, all of the world heritage sites. Now the program under which these different sites are recognized are indicated in parentheses, the year in which these programs came into effect. As you can see, most of the three of them, Ramsar, Biosphere Reserves and World Heritage go back to almost 50 years, uh, Biosphere Reserves and the Man of the Biosphere Program, which uh, designates Biosphere Reserve uh, and Ramsar Convention commemorated their 50 year anniversary this year in 2021 and World Heritage will do so next year in 2022. Whereas Global Geoparks is a more recent one in 19, it started in 1998 and the first designations happened in the year 2000. And uh, because of that there, you will see there are some differences in how they are designated and how they operate. Now, some of these, uh, some of these uh, designated areas, some of these ideas are better suited to adapt to the current day discussions on sustainable development, climate change mitigation and adaptation and other agendas compared to others. Now, for example, Ramsar, the Ramsar Convention, now they have uh, in the 13th COP, in the 13th Conference, Conference of Parties of the Ramsar Convention, I think that was in 2018, they have recognized 18 cities uh, or eight accredited 18 cities as wetland cities. And one of them is Jeju. In fact, my hometown in Sri Lanka, Colombo, is also a wetland city. So the wetland cities are not um, natural areas. They are much more complex. And uh, so the type of uh, IDAs we will be dealing with uh, under these four categories of sites are quite complex now. And uh, that, thing, that requires a lot of uh, thinking about how we can involve local communities in the management of these areas in ways, of, in ways and means which are beneficial to communities as well as the management. Now, um, Coming to the global uh, or more global environment development relationship agenda, <clears throat> the, the turning point is the first Earth Summit in Rio 1992 because 
that event marked a turning point where conventions and programs became more policy oriented. For example, World Heritage, World Heritage and Ramsar Convention are place specific, they are ecosystem specific, site specific. There are other conventions which were from those times like CITES, Convention on International Trade on Endangered Species, they are species specific. But 1992, the Convention on Climate Change, Biological Diversity, and the Convention to Combat Desertification, they don't talk about specific areas or species. They talk about policy level approaches, which has to be adopted by national governments in order to implement those conventions. The same thing goes to Agenda 21, which was also adopted in, uh, uh, in Rio 1992. It's also a very broad based agenda. It cut, cuts across all the development sectors and hence uh, it requires national level leadership to implement uh, specific actions at the local and municipal levels. <clears throat> now, since 1992, as you all know, climate change related science, diplomacy and international relations, they have become very prominent. They have, you know, there are people who worry about it sometimes because they think that they are even overshadowing biodiversity issues and uh, desertification issues. But then climate change uh, has uh, been uh, talked about in such a way that it has attracted a lot of government's uh, attention because it, it, is, it appears it's going to affect the economies and financial matters of governments dealing with development. So it's, it's a very, very sensitive convention. It requires a, a lot of different changes which will affect a lot of different people and different, uh, different kinds of uh, actors. Uh, one thing to notice is uh, in recent years, for example, the Paris Agreement, which was, uh, which was adopted in 2015, it, explicitly recognizes that implementation is going to be nationally de determined con contributions, NDCs as they say. Similarly, sustainable development, uh, the goals which were adopted in 2015 also, they are universal. They don't distinguish between developing and developed countries. They're applicable to all. Whereas the millennium development goals which were adopted in 2000, they still operated on the basis of donor countries and recipient countries. So things have changed now since uh, Rio 1992, the conventions and the pro global agendas are more broad based, more policy and strategy driven rather than plays of species specific. And they are also being driven by uh, national leadership. And of course, there are grow they are global agendas, but the leadership has to come from national level policies and strategies. Now, uh, all these uh, post-1992 changes and events, particularly since 2015, when the Climate Change uh, Paris Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals have been adopted, they all require that uh, we don't separate conservation and development as two different, entirely different uh, uh, trajectories of movement. We have to link them. and. and and more and more people are thinking up for landscape level rather than uh, place or restricted protected area specific level. So here is an example. This comes from Vietnam uh, Man and the Biosphere Program Committee to think about uh, how to adapt to changes which came after the 1992 period and how these different uh, uh, Rio conventions could be linked in a particular landscape in relation to speed, particular kinds of activities. It could include uh, clean development or energy efficiency and zero emission activities, which all come under the Climate Change Convention, commitment to CBD, long-term monitoring, et cetera, that comes to CBD convention. And then um, Vietnam strategy for sustainable development, that's the national agenda 21, which includes a lot of land use change related issues and strategies which relate specifically to 
uh, la uh, preventing land degradation and desertification types of activities. Now, this kind of spectrum of activities uh, can be placed in relation to the four different types of ID, uh, IDAs we are dealing with. And the next slide shows this. As you see, uh, the, the biosphere reserves are ideally suited for these large landscape level designations uh, because they consider different zones, the core zone being the, the, the zone for biodiversity conservation primarily, whereas the buffer and transition zones uh, allow a gradation of uh, economic uh, and social development activities, which, are, uh, which could be tried out on an experimental basis as to how they fit some of these global agendas, whether that is climate change mitigation and adaptation, uh, sustainable development, uh, combating land degradation and desertification issues, and many others. So this uh, broad uh, landscape level thinking of uh, biosphere reserves is ideally suited for that. Uh, as you can see, world heritage is uh, really, particularly world natural heritage sites, national parks, and even geoparks, they are more on the on the biodiversity conservation end of the spectrum. Geoparks are uh, slightly different because they started in 1998. They automatically had to adapt to the post-Rio expectations of uh, areas meeting sustainable development needs of communities. So they allow for a certain amount of interaction between people and uh, uh, geological uh, features that are contained in national uh, geoparks. But World Natural Heritage Sites, as you will see later on, they are quite, uh, they are quite uh, rigid or strict in terms of the conservation and the protection side rather than, and they have, they had to undergo much more uh, adaptation in terms of uh, adjusting to catering to local community needs and sustainable development needs of people. Uh, Rams site, you know, they are very specific. They are wetlands. Uh, they are areas where, which are important for international migratory birds, as well as uh, they preserve important wetland ecosystems. And they can be found uh, in many landscapes, whether that is uh, totally natural or they are anthropogenic. So they are, they, their presence is, uh, is uh, well well uh, documented and they are the largest number of IDAs in the world at the moment. They are, their numbers are around 2,400 sites. Uh, the next being World Heritage, but if you take only World Natural Heritage sites, it's about 200 sites. <clears throat> now, um, the next slide here, there is this, uh, this is a World Heritage site in uh, East Trenel in Solomon Island. It's only the part uh, below the red line, which is World Heritage. The other part is not. It's, uh, it's uh, not designated under any protected categories or management categories. And these kinds of designations can create a lot of problems in the future. Now, tourism, which is uh, taken a bad hit uh, during recent times due to COVID uh, and related uh, constraints on international travel, has been considered a problem area in many World Heritage Sites. For example, the East Trenel Island, uh, which I showed in the previous slide, they were hoping that they can develop a very strong tourism industry, but they didn't succeed because they, were, they are an island which is far off in the Pacific Ocean. They are not easily accessible. So expectations of tourism development did not always materialize in all the IDAs, which were hoping to do it, but some of them which succeeded, they had the over visitation and uh, other issues related to tourism infrastructure development and other issues. This is uh, data from uh, 2018 World Heritage Com uh, State of Conservation Report. As you see, uh, impacts of tourism, visitors and recreation, uh, major visitor accommodation and associated infrastructure, uh, et cetera, are uh, problem areas for some of the idea management, particularly World Heritage Site Management. Now, now we are in a stage where uh, we are in a stage where a lot of places, particularly in Eastern South Africa, South Asian countries, 
where they were totally dependent on tourism for revenue generation, they have to rethink their strategies because uh, the tourism's recovery is not going to be quick. And even if it is so, it's going to be quick in countries like China or US where the tourism is largely dependent on domestic visitation. But where visitation is dependent on international uh, arrivals, it's going to be slow. Uh, and the question is now whether it is smart now that we have had this experience of COVID and uh, total disruption of international travel, whether it is smart to totally depend local people and local community involvement on tourism development alone. So we have to start thinking about more land use and land use change adaptation measures that come as part of climate change and sustainable development and how they could be linked to the development of opportunities for local communities around uh, IDAs, particularly in buffer and transition zones of bias, bias reserves, as well as in places like uh, this, for example, uh, this area, other than outside of the world heritage, know what's going to happen. As you will see, there are some major threats there. So we, these are some of the issues which are going to come up in uh, local community IDA relationship in the next few years when GCDA and other groups will take up a major role in guiding these thinking and practices. Now, UNESCO, GCDA is a UNESCO category two center and UNESCO strategies uh, have called for developing UNESCO designated sites as learning sites for inclusive and comprehensive approaches to environmental, economic and social development, mm -hmm. uh, social aspects of sustainable development. It's easily said than done. Um, as you saw the Vietnam uh, slides, they already started thinking about how this could be done. But I think now we have, uh, since uh, since uh, 2015, the adoption of these uh, 17 different sustainable development goals. And the question is, uh, in every particular site, individual sites, what kind of combination of SDGs can we try out? That's important to think through because you cannot go to every site and try to do all 17 sites. Uh, you have to prioritize individual sites and uh, the, the, the interest of the local communities involved in individual sites, what they prioritize as uh, SDGs and how they could be met as part, of our, as part of the management of these IDAs. Those are important issues which will come up in the next five to 10 years of uh, local community IDA relationships. Now, for example, I'm coming back to this East Rennell Island. This, there is a major threats because there are forestry concessions just outside of uh, the World Heritage Sites, which are marked B3, C2, C3, and A1. And even as part of the World Heritage Site, there are forestry concessions and this, uh, this, uh, this World Heritage Site was the first natural heritage site which were totally based on community-based protected area practices. There was no national protected area legislation to back it up. So the current situation of this area, if the community says, we don't want World Heritage status anymore because uh, we expected tourism development and nothing has happened, then they will go for uh, land use practices like forestry or mining, which is detrimental or against the uh, World Heritage designation. So there is a there is a lot of tension in these sites, and hence uh, even for World Heritage sites, of course the buffer zone requirement is there, but it's more for protection of the core area rather than in terms of looking at how development practices outside of the core area could be managed in such a way that the conflict between local community aspirations and the conservation requirements of World Heritage could be minimized. So there are places like this where the tension between local community and World Heritage management will increase, but the other categories, other categories of IDAs, they have a better way of uh, uh, managing these things. And uh, there are a lot of sites, for example, uh, Jeju itself, which has all four IDA designations within the same territory. So these are good areas to experiment with different types of approaches for the different type of IDAs as to how the local community 
management relationship could be managed. What I like is to think about in the future, you know, this is a slide or this is a, in a figure from a Scientific American article in 2006. It's about imagining the farm of the future and a farm of the future is not going to be totally dependent on traditional crops like uh, wheat or corn, but it's also going to be using a lot of different land use approaches to meet sustainable development goals. For example, carbon dioxide offset credits that's related to SDG 13, which talks about combating climate change. Biodiversity credits can be related to SDG 14 or 15, 14 being ocean related and 15 being land related. Renewable electricity, this could be SDG 6 or 7, like uh, SDG 6 is what SDG 7 is renewable electricity. So there, there are various types of land uses which are becoming possible and which could be linked to financing, funding and income generation. Now to go into details of this, it will take time, but these opportunities are coming up. Uh, for example, the, the Green Climate Fund uh, established under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Climate Agreement, it is based in Korea. It's, uh, it's, a big, it's, it's the biggest uh, uh, environmental fund now operating and they provide a lot of support for this kind of experimental uh, landscape level activities where you try to connect conservation and development and development catering to some of these post-1992 global agendas like climate change mitigation and adaptation and meeting sustainable development goals. So these are interesting experiments that uh, that is worth looking at into the future as part of IDEA local community relations. In China, for example, uh, there is even uh, a greater level of uh, experimentation. This is a slide. This is in a place called uh, uh, Wudalianchi in the Northeast China, where Chinese are practicing what they call ecological migration. They are moving people out of uh, areas which have been set aside for biodiversity conservation. This is an area where people were living inside the core zone and they provided them uh, offers and options and they moved them into a new town. This, this is an eco city now and they, are, they have actually created the, for the people who moved into that area opportunities for employment, education, recreation, and even new facilities for water purification and various other things. So they have basically created a new eco city, basically it's based on sustainable development model and principles. Um, sustainability is being talked about. It's a, it's a coming together of ecological, economic and social dimensions of development. But as I said, it's easier said than done. You know, it's like, uh, if you know this slide, you know, you, you know, if you want to take food, you know, you can, uh, you can have fast food, good food, cheap food, but uh, you cannot have all three at the same time. Uh, there are a similar thinking uh, which uh, goes through a lot of different uh, subject areas. The other is called a trilemma problem, and it has come out of uh, uh, out of uh, Dan Roderick's research in JF Kennedy School of Government in uh, Harvard. And the idea is, for example, it says that democracy, national sovereignty, and the global economic integration are mutually incompatible. You know, three different things you are trying to balance and think of trade-off. It's not easy. Uh, we can combine any two of the three, but never have all three simultaneously and in full. Now, this is something which is uh, worth thinking about in terms of our approach to sustainable development benefiting local communities living around IDAs. It could be a new series of uh, uh, practice-based experimentation and research and data gathering because it is possible that you cannot uh, deliver more than a combination of two good things uh, at any particular time uh, period. And now, uh, uh, there was an article in the Financial Times weekend of 14th and 15th August about Los Angeles. As you all probably know, a lot of people must be reading now, there have been a lot of fires in Los Angeles. 
Now, but at the same time, Los Angeles also due to sea level rise faces uh, other threats due to sea level rise, the erosion of coastal areas, beaches going away, property, beach properties getting affected and so on. But then the sustainability officer of uh, uh, Los Angeles, Faber O'Connor, was very specific. Yes, the city is a coastal city and our analysis shows that sea level rise is an issue. But we are most heavily invested in the near term is really around urban cooling and water acidity. So they are taken two different things which they can manage at this particular time and they are focusing on it. They cannot focus on all of all the things at the same time. So what I like is to end with a suggestion to uh, GCDA management and administration, which hopefully will pick up speed and start new things uh, as of now going into the future. Perhaps launch a program where you start uh, looking at local community idea relationship from the point of view of research, data gathering, as well as training. From the research point of view, it will be good to do a literature search and a survey to build a database on local community management relations in all four IDAs. You can actually aim to build a library of insightful case studies, both pre-COVID and post-COVID. And there are techniques now for literature research and bibliometric research, which could help you to identify what were the most important past research and, and what are the ones which are emerging for the future. Now, these kinds of uh, uh, findings can help you to focus your training for managers who are linked to ideas and uh, who are trying to deliver sustainable development goals as part of their relationship between uh, management of uh, ideas and helping local communities. The training and uh, related uh, activities to help managers could be better designed and better organized. The content can be much more rich than just doing uh, run of the mill uh, business as usual uh, uh, training courses. I think it is uh, interesting to run a series of action research in uh, local community uh, idea relationship where you work with the communities so that they identify the two most important SDGs they want to focus for the next five years. Because I, as I said, I don't think it's, it's possible to address more than two uh, of these SDGs at a particular time. So, but uh, rather than the management choosing it, maybe the management and the community can sit together and uh, choose these things so that they can attract uh, funding and financial support. So if you have 40 different uh, IDAs in different parts of the world, each testing out different combination of SDGs, how to, attain, how to attain those SDGs in combination with the management of the IDAs, then you will create a, a laboratory of experiments globally from which you can draw very interesting insights and uh, for conclusions as to how local community uh, involvement in IDAs could be supported as part of current day agendas on sustainable development, climate change mitigation and adaptation, biodiversity conservation, as well as uh, preventing land degradation and desertification. As you all may know, this year is the beginning of a UN decade on ecosystem restoration. So that's becoming a very important agenda as well. So I think uh, GCDA is now at the right moment to uh, start and launch some interesting research and training agenda built around local community uh, idea relationship or idea management relationship, but uh, introducing some new ideas about how to link uh, the delivery of SDGs in and around this area in a more pragmatic and practical way rather than on a very theoretical and ideological manner. That's all I want to say. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Ish, for your uh, insightful speech. Uh, you uh, quickly reviewed the history or trend of internationally designated areas and also stressed the importance of the local community's involvement. 
Uh, I am sure you offered some very helpful and valuable pointers for everyone uh, today. And also, thank you very much for your uh, suggestions for the uh, Global Research and Training Center. Uh, we, will, uh, we take note and hopefully follow up to your suggestion. Thank you very much. And now we will be moving on to hear the case presentations and followed by the panel discussions. Uh, as each uh, has kindly agreed to chair this session, I will hand the floor back to him. Please, Ish, the floor is yours. Oh. Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. OK. OK, good. Um, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, Kim, uh, yeah. old friend. Yes, we do. And I'm also very happy to be able to be part of this uh, thematic seminar on management challenges for internationally designated areas. I hope the presentations and the discussions will help you to inspire and uh, develop new ideas and build your management capacity. And I also hope that you will uh, share your thoughts and questions during the seminar through quick, uh, the question and answer tab uh, or Zoom chat. And I can see it's already happening. There are lots of questions and uh, ideas being thrown in. I have already answered one question regarding to uh, the Wood Alianchi site in China. Somebody asked me the name of the eco city. There is no name for that city. It's just adjacent to the site. It's a small uh, city, but then the thing is, uh, it's a real eco city. They have really built it around uh, new ideas of waste management, water purification, uh, etc. So anyway, we'll come to those things uh, more during the panel discussion. Now I'm going to ask the first speaker among the three panelists, uh, Mr. Theodore Brown from Itoigawa Geopark of Japan to make his presentation. Mr. Brown. Hello, everyone. I'm Theodore Brown from the Doigawa UNESCO Global Geopark, and I'm here today to talk about community involvement in the Doigawa UNESCO Global Geopark by engaging and empowering communities for sustainable development, site management, and education. So I've got a lot to talk about today. don't have a lot of time to talk about it, so uh, uh, please uh, Bear with me if I get a little bit uh, rushed. So first, I'd like to talk a little bit about Itoigawa. So as you can see here, Itoigawa is located on the uh, northwestern coast of Japan. Um, it's a relatively rural area, area of about 746 square kilometers, with a population of about 41,000 people. So here we see an aerial view of Itoigawa. The uh, borders of Itoigawa City and the Itoigawa Geopark are shown here. As you can see, over 85% of the area is a mountain uh, forested regions. Uh, people live in small uh, communities along the coast and in uh, valleys up in the mountains. And so Doigao was actually formed in 2005 by a merger of the city, uh, the uh, former city of Doigao and the towns of Omi and No. This is a little bit important when I talk later about why we started a geopark. Uh, some of the main features of our geopark include the Itoigawa Shizuoka Tectonic Line, which is a, a massive fault which runs through the center of our geopark and actually splits the Japanese islands in two, uh, uh, east and west, uh, geologically. And so uh, we can see there's a very big difference in age uh, from one side of the fault to the other. On the western side, we have uh, geology, which is up to 500 million years old, while the geology on the East side is all younger than 16 million years. This is uh, very closely connected to the uh, formation of the Japanese islands. And so we can learn the story about how the Japanese islands formed at Itoigawa Geopark. And we can see this Itoigawa Shizuoka tectonic line here at the Fossil Magna Park. We can see how the uh, rocks on either side of the fault are different colors. Uh, we are also known for the world's oldest jade working culture. So we have uh, some of Japan's uh, largest and only uh, gemstone jade producing regions, the uh, Omigawa and Kotakigawa jade gorges. We can see the Kotakigawa jade gorge here. And these uh, jade from these gorges was collected by the prehistoric Jomon people uh, living in the area. 
who uh, fashioned it into jade beads, much like the one you see here. Uh, we are also uh, sitting on the uh, border between Eastern and Western Japan. And so uh, this is sort of a cultural border. Uh, Japan's cultures are widely divided between uh, Eastern Japanese culture and Western Japanese culture. And this uh, divide is along this Itoigawa Shizuoka tectonic line. And the reason for this is these uh, large uh, mountains, the Japanese Alps, and the uh, cliffs here. We see the cliffs of Oyashirazu, which formed alongside this tectonic line. And so you can see here the uh, cliffs of Oyashirazu were very difficult uh, to pass through in ancient times. And so this caused a cultural drift between the Eastern and Japanese, uh, Eastern and Western cultures. And uh, this is not only a cultural divide, but also a geological border because we see uh, the uh, Itoigawa Shizuoka tectonic line forms a uh, plate boundary between the Eurasian and the North American continental plates. And we can see this boundary here in Itoigawa. So why start a geopark in uh, Itoigawa? And so we had three main uh, goals, three main reasons for uh, wanting to start a geopark. The first, of course, was to protect and utilize our local heritage, geological, natural, uh, cultural heritage. We wanted to protect these uh, sort of treasures that we had here and then use them in order to improve the lives of the people. And we also wanted to uh, sort of uh, engage in more uh, human resource development. We wanted to use uh, the geopark model, this geopark philosophy, in order to shape new generations and encourage the the concept of sustainable societies within Itoigawa. And then finally, uh, this goes back to what I was saying before, we wanted to develop a sense of unity for the newly uh, founded city of Itoigawa. So we wanted to unite the people of No, Omi, and Itoigawa under one brand. And we wanted to use this brand to develop sustainable, uh, well, to encourage sustainable regional development, uh, which puts local residents first and enriches their lives for decades to come. And so some of the keys uh, we found in engaging the local community have been sort of meaningful inclusion within our management structure, as well as regular and multilateral communication, uh, the uh, adapting the existing networks and structures to uh, meet our goals and to uh, take an interdisciplinary approach to geopark studies. So first uh, talking about our uh, geopark management and how the community is involved in this. Uh, we have the Itoigawa Geopark Council. The Itoigawa Geopark Council is, consists of 34 um, member uh, organizations. These uh, range from national government bodies uh, down to uh, local resident groups. And so uh, many of these, uh, in fact, over half of them are sort of local, either local businesses or local organizations. And so we try to include these local organizations and local community groups in our geopark management structure from the very beginning. And so uh, we have here just an example of the Doigawa Geopark Council structure, and we have uh, many working groups focused on uh, various areas. In each one of these, we include members of the uh, local community uh, in order to make sure that we have their input at every level of the Geopark uh, management body. And so uh, through this, we've been able to have a great deal of participation from our local community including uh, they help us uh, with uh, revalidation missions. Here we see our uh, last revalidation mission in 2017. Uh, they help us in developing new projects. Uh, we have some uh, new uh, Itoigawa Bonsai projects in uh, uh, starting here with uh, local organizations. Uh, they help us manage the sites as well. So they, they help in the maintenance. Uh, for example, here at Takanomi Noike Pond, uh, they help in the site maintenance and um, and in the operation of gift shops and restaurants and things like that. And they also uh, operate tours within their local geo, geo uh, sites, uh, like we see here in the uh, Umidani Gorge in the Nishumi uh, district. And so we also uh, place an emphasis on communication uh, through sort of a multilateral, uh, diversified approach, uh, because we have a very diverse audience within our geopark. And in order to reach this uh, diverse audience, we need a diversified strategy. And so we have uh, many different uh, tools that we use for uh, communicating um, with our uh, 
members of our uh, public. So we have uh, things like social media, websites, newsletters, and signage, um, mailing lists, and press releases, uh, things like that. And then uh, through indirect communication as well, through, uh, for example, the uh, city newsletter, which is delivered to every household within Toegawa, uh, we uh, have lots of information that we include within that, as well as within uh, individual community newsletters, school newsletters, and uh, other communication through our partner or partner organizations. And uh, because of this, we have a very high level of awareness within our uh, local population. You can see well over 90% of the people living in Itoegawa are uh, aware of the geopark and the kind of activities that our geopark uh, does. And uh, this is a very Im important part of uh, our uh, strategy as well is the way uh, we adapt existing networks. I think uh, every community uh, around the world has its own uh, existing sort of network of relation relationships and uh, hierarchies. And so rather than sort of installing our own uh, hierarchy within these communities, we make use of the existing uh, systems, the existing uh, networks that these communities already have in order to achieve our goals. Uh, probably the most important for us is uh, interacting with the uh, regional community centers. And so uh, the city of Itoigawa is divided into 21 regions. Uh, each one of these regions has its own uh, community center, uh, which, um, which coordinates uh, different activities and uh, programs within that region. And then these uh, 21 regional community centers are then uh, connected by three uh, regional networks as well. And so these three regional networks, these uh, regional headsman councils, they're called, we include them within our Itoigawa Geopark Council organization. And so through this, we are able to communicate with each of the different regions within the city of Itoigawa. And so this allows us to have a very uh, high level of participation, especially in uh, geo tours and other uh, geopark activities uh, that we hold each year. And uh, finally, I'd like to talk about uh, the way we use education to uh, push community engagement. And so within our city, we have a unified education policy that we uh, worked with the local board of education to develop. And so this unified education policy covers children from the age of zero to 18. So it's a complete uh, unified education policy, uh, which includes geo study as a core uh, as a core part, a uh, core feature of the curriculum. And so we can see here's an example of some uh, geo-study activities for children from ages from zero to six. And so we have examples of, for example, uh, things they can do at home, things they, they can do to school and things that they can do within their community in order to uh, learn and learn about and enjoy the Itoegawa Geopark. And so by including this as a uh, core uh, feature of the local curriculum, we're able to not only reach uh, all of the children living in Itoigawa, but we're also able to reach their parents. And this is very important for us because many of the parents of these children are in that crucial uh, 20s to 40s demographic that we would really like to uh, include more in geopark activities, but uh, can be more difficult to reach. Uh, because you know they're new parents, they're they're working, and they they tend to be uh, not have as much free time to participate in various uh, activities throughout the geopark. We promote these geopark studies through the development of different textbooks. And what I think is very important here is that we don't focus just on the uh, science textbooks, but we also produce uh, social studies and uh, other um, materials that can be used at in a more sort of holistic approach to uh, geo studies. Uh, some of the results we can see from this, we can see uh, elementary school students who have uh, taken it upon themselves to uh, create new signs, uh, to uh, new uh, guide signs for their local geo sites. Uh, the uh, students at this elementary school visited a local site and they felt it needed more uh, signs. And so they, they approached us and they asked if they would be able to 
build their own signs and install them. And of course, we we uh, supported them in this. And we also have uh, in the junior high school level uh, students uh, using their time during their geopark studies program to make promotional videos promoting the geopark. Then at the high school level, uh, we have uh, some examples of some different uh, events and forums and uh, and other uh, activities that uh, local high schools have done to learn more about sustainable development goals, uh, disaster risk reduction, and other geopark topics. And uh, we can see through these activities a um, that the children in Itoigawa are much more community minded and much more motivated um, compared to the uh, national average. We can see the uh, some data here from a 2019 national survey showing that uh, students in Itoigawa participate more in community events. They're more interested in improving their local community and they're more interested in sharing the community with others. And uh, we think this is uh, very important in the development of uh, future generations of motivated and engaged uh, local community. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't really have uh, enough time to go into uh, more detail, but uh, this is sort of the kind of activities that we do with our local community here in the Toyo UNESCO Global Geopark. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you. To Mr. Brown, that was very clear and very thoughtful of you. And uh, Mr. Brown, I, I, I forgot to mention that he has worked in Itaigawa Geopark as a member of the management team for a while now. So he was quite clear about how the management integrates uh, local community interests. Uh, let's move on to the next presentation. We'll keep all the burning questions you may have for later during the panel discussion. The next speaker is Ms. Yu Nam Chan. She's the head of the Hong Kong UNESCO Global Park. She's going to share a case of local communities involvement in Hong Kong UNESCO Ge Global Geopark. Uh, Ms. Chan has worked in agriculture, fisheries, and conservation department of the Hong Kong government since 2003, and was also involved in the establishment of the geopark, uh, Hong Kong Geopark, uh, about which she's going to talk about. So the floor is yours, Madam Cha. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for attending this uh, seminar. So let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is um, Chen Yunnan, or you can just call me Nam. I am the head of Hong Kong UNESCO Global Geopark. So I'll share with you the involvement of local communities in our geopark. Um, I the way we um, involve the local communities is quite special. Um, I think we treat the local communities as friends, as real partners. And we have, in recent years, um, a special project to promote the culture, history of these local communities in order to promote their sustainable development. So I'll, in this presentation, explain uh, our work. And apart from the uh, local communities or the local villages, I'll also share um, some of our work with NGOs and also sponsors, because sponsors may be something quite special. So let me introduce um, the general situation in Hong Kong. So um, this is Hong Kong. The urban areas is mainly here. And this is Hong Kong Joe Park. And the local communities, uh, you can see there are quite some like here, uh, one here. So, of course, the local villages uh, in our Joe Park, they are located at the periphery or at the margin of Hong Kong, very remote they are. So, here are some of the villages that we work with, but these are not the only villages within Hong Kong Joe Park. There are far more villages, but um, we focus our work on these villages because we have to prior prioritize our work, of course. and. Mostly we work with uh, like Ap Zhao, Kat O, uh, like Zi Wo, and also like Gao Sai Village, which I will explain more. So I think this is the same in many places in the world. In the past, like in the 1960s, the many, many people living on these remote villages 
um, for example, get O is an okay, get O is this one. So an island like, like uh, at, a, at a very remote island. So these small islands in the 1960s, there are 6,000 people living on these islands. You can see these are the houses. It's a fishing village. Also, um, there are uh, Hakka people who are farmers on this island. But now, of course, there are like maybe 30 to 50 residents on this island only. Of course, because of different reasons, um, because of the, the remoteness, lack of infrastructure, no transport and no economic activities, all sorts of these reasons. So people moved out. Um, it is interesting to see that um, the natural and geological heritages of these villages are well protected because no one there. But with the um, uh, with without people living in these villages, of course, the, the customs, the culture, the history of these uh, villages are being forgotten. So in the, uh, 20, uh, 2017, we started a new project called Same Roots, Same Origins Project. Um, the aim of the project, of course, is to preserve the history and culture of these local communities. Actually, these uh, villages have very interesting and rich history and culture. And the, the history of these villages is actually part of the history of whole Hong Kong. And these um, materials are very interesting and also very good resources for education and for uh, green tourism. We can promote um, their stories to students and to tourists. And ultimately, of course, we want to promote the sustainable development of these um, communities. So in here, you can see the rich history and customs of these villages, like they have, own, they have their own festivals, their own food, their special way of living and their costume, um, yeah, uh, their own festivals, etc. So how, how do we do this? So to preserve the cultural heritage, the main methods we use is oral history interviews. Um, we interview a lot of villages. Um, oh, there's one point, uh, one thing I have to explain. These, village, these villages, actually, um, they moved to, some of them moved to the urban areas in Hong Kong, but many of them moved to other countries, like uh, the UK, other countries. So when we conduct interviews, we, of course, we interview those in Hong Kong, but we also interview those who live in um, UK or overseas. So we, I think we, uh, we interview tens of villages um, for each village, mostly. And then um, we also record their customs and festivals. So nowadays, um, most of, some of these villages, they still continue their festivals. Like like this one, did we call them Baatio, or uh, like a, a a festival to celebrate the uh, the birth of a goddess? So we record them, and uh, of course we conduct a lot. Uh, we collect a, a lot of materials from them, like these are the old records from the village. So this is uh, how we conduct interviews. So we we we, we interview them at their home, or we have um, site visits with them. And these are the pictures taken in UK. Actually, we interview some of the villages in UK. So after we collect a lot of information, of course, from these villages, the stories, the customs, we, we have a process of digesting these information and turn them into stories that uh, can, can be tangible to the public, to the students. So we present them as publications like books like here so we have main, mainly like two books we publish in the past like this and yes. then we also establish story rooms these are visitor centers within the, the village so we establish four story rooms in the past like these are the villages that i mentioned we work mostly on like Abzhao, Gao, uh, Gaosai village and it's called Lai Zi War. So each story rooms um, 
present the unique stories or history of these villages because each village has their own own stories, their own customs. Mm. So how do we um, promote the sustainable development of the communities? Um, okay, as I explained, we have story rooms and we employ the local villages as guys, as men, as managers of the of these uh, story rooms. And of course, uh, if they have to work in the story rooms, they have to provide some training and capacity building, like to uh, help them learn how to give interpretation to, um, to the public, to visitors. Um, with the employment of local villages within the story rooms, we find that it's it is a good way to raise the villagers' sense of belonging. So if they feel proud of their village and they are they take ownership of their village. So it's a good way to attract um, villagers back to the their village and to work in the storerooms. And it's also provide an opportunity for the villagers to come back to at least to be interested to come back to the village and to work in the village. Also. It is a good way, um, it also benefits the uh, visitors because um, for the visitors with a local villager, telling stories in the story rooms is far more interesting than an outsider from urban area Hong Kong to tell the stories. You can see like in this case, with the villager, they would tell the story or tell her own story. So they would point to the picture, a photo on the on the wall and said, this is me, I actually studied in this school, or I, or I actually um, lived on the boat before um, I follow with my parents to go out to catch fish. So it is far more interesting. So we find that um, this way of employing villagers uh, in the story rooms benefits both the visitors and the local villagers. Um, we also sometimes conduct like visits between the communities. So the villagers from Abzhou can visit the other villages in the, uh, like Gao Sai Zhao in the south, and they can share their experience in managing the visitors or their interaction with the um, visitor, uh, the, the tourists. And they also just find it interesting to visit the other villages. This can help to raise their morale and also raise their sense of belonging. Um, as another point that I want to point out is that um, we treat the local communities really as friends or real partners. That means we offer help to these villages as far as reasonable and practicable. So sometimes, um, of course, we, sometimes we can offer direct assistance but sometimes uh, when we don't have the power, we have to be liaised with other government departments or organizations. So I give you some examples here. So this is a case of um, after a super typhoon, uh, we mobilized volunteers to help uh, clean up uh, the, the rubbish that was on the, on, on the island. So in this way, we, we offer direct assistance, but we also liaise with other government departments to um, uh, resume some utilities, electricity, or repair the footpath. And we also have a close relationship with the local communities. Actually, whenever they, they, they have a problem, they would raise to us and we would help as far as uh, possible, especially um, issues that, um, that are in conflict with um, tourists. So for example, during the COVID-19, we help these villagers to produce this banner to advise uh, tourists to wear masks when they visit these uh, these sites, or um, some villagers they uh, observe that some visitors they climb on this old tree, so we help them produce this banner advising the tourists don't climb on me, don't climb on this old tree. So these are the examples of how we we have a close relationship with the local communities and. Um, Whenever they need help, they would raise to us, and if reasonable and practicable, we would help them. And then, 
So um, I will also introduce um, the involvement of local community, uh, local uh, NGOs uh, in our Geo Park. Actually, they are an important partner of our Geo Park, uh, as, and as, as I guess in um, many other places. Similarly, they help us organize education activities. Uh, they help promote Hong Kong Geo Park. Um, there's another important um, work that they assist us. Um, they assist the capacity building of villages. As I mentioned, we actually need some training for the villages and the angels help, help to provide these trainings. And uh, they also help us develop sustainable development. Uh, for example, some angels, they, they're willing to um, organize uh, trial tour packages um, when the market is not right, but um, they're willing to try a new tour rules or new tour package, especially those that are, um, that can help uh, or some new um, tour, uh, tour activities uh, that involve local communities. So in Hong Kong, uh, there's a NGO we call um, Association for Geoconservation Hong Kong. And this NGO, um, we, we are very grateful that they help us in collaboration launch a recommended geopark guide system. It's a special guide system for Hong Kong geopark uh, in order to uphold the quality of tour guides and uh, tours. So another point uh, I want to uh, present is sponsors. I don't know if uh, other Jopas have sponsors, but for us, luckily, we have quite some, some a few sponsors. So um, of course, they provide funding for support. And it's important that uh, with this funding support, it's more flexible and allow us to do some small projects uh, that require flexibility because for government departments, of course, we, we have uh, some restrictions on the use of money. So the, the funding support, not necessarily a big uh, amount, but they help us to be flexible in doing some projects. And they also help to co-manage some projects and offer technical advice, like because, for example, uh, we establish story rooms in these remote villages, and they have expertise on the restoration of these uh, village houses. So they are very helpful in, um, in some of our projects. So this is uh, the pictures of a sponsor. We call them uh, Lions Nature Education Foundation. They have us actually establish um, some of these story rooms. So I just want to point out that um, um, our involvement of local communities is um, we, we try to dig out their rich history, their rich um, stories, and turn them into um, uh, like story rooms and stories uh, that are uh, tangible to the visitors. And we find it we use this way to benefit both the uh, local communities and also the visitors. Um, so this is the way how we uh, involve the local communities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Chan. The next presenter is Ms. Miyung Kwan from Yoncheon Geo Eco Network. She's the owner of the geographer, geo partner restaurant in Yoncheon in the Republic of Korea. And she has been part of the local network formed voluntarily by the local citizens of the Yoncheon site. Now this site is a combination of a uh, Yoncheon Injin River Bass Reserve and the Hantan River UNESCO Global Geopark. So it's a site with double designation. And uh, Madam uh, Kwon is a local citizen herself. So it'll be interesting to hear her perspective. So Madam Kwon, you can start your presentation. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'll be presenting a case under the theme of involvement of local communities in internationally designated areas. I live in Yeoncheon-gun, home to the Yeoncheon Imjin River Biosphere Reserve and Hantan River UNESCO Global Geopark. 
I am also a member of the Yonton Geo Eco Network, and my name is, as introduced, Kwon Mi Young. Now, what I do is I help introduce local foods in Yonton by making lunch boxes out of the local delicacies and local foods you can find in Yonton for visitors. And we are also a partner of the Hantan River UNESCO Global Geopark. The Yonton Geo Eco Network has a website, as you can see here the link introduced we have a youtube channel and much more as listed here so please feel free to visit any of these sites if you want to know more about us the yonton geo eco network is comprised of 10 members one of whom is a sixth grader in elementary school the members of the yonton geo eco network are also all members of birds korea which is headed by Dr. Mu, who is also a member of our network. The following is a list of our members, including a sixth grader, as I said before. To give you a bit of background about our interest in geology and in the geology and ecology of Yeoncheon-gun, let's go back to June 2019 when an evaluation was carried out for the accreditation of the Hantan River UNESCO Global Geopark. And GeoFood, the organization that I talked about earlier that I am in charge of, cater catered the dinner banquet at that time. I got to know the people there, and this really uh, started to pique my interest. To be honest, at first I didn't know anything. I didn't know what value IDAs had and so on and so forth. But all the members put up banners congratulating the accreditation of Hantan River UNESCO Global Geopark. This was the Biosphere Reserve Seminar and Global Geopark Seminar that were hosted by the Yeoncheon-gun District Office. Since we weren't familiar with all of these concepts back then, we joined as participants to learn more, and we were so intrigued and found it so interesting and fun. Now, this was the seminar on the sustainable development of Hantan River Geo Park, hosted by the district office and EcoGeo team. During this seminar, we got to witness the installation of the frog ladder, which was so much fun, and drove home the message that this type of work is required to preserve biodiversity. Now, this was the point when we really dived into learning more and studying about IDAs. These were pictures taken during on-site education and training sessions provided by the district office that we participated in. And after these experiences, we began to witness changes within ourselves, actually. Now, what changes, you might say? Well, the changes were that we decided to work in nature, and we found it to be fun, and we found it to be extremely relaxing. So we were now in tune with nature, and we thought it would be a shame to keep this to ourselves and decided to share this newfound joy with other people. And this was what led to numerous different projects and experiences. First was related to the frog ladder, which we had learned about during the previous seminars. And so we got to talking among, amongst ourselves. The frog ladder that was made before was made out of metal, but we thought, uh, what could we do to improve upon this? And we came to the conclusion that we could try building ladders with easily accessible materials that can be found in nature that are more, more eco-friendly. So we decided to use coir mats and rope to make an eco-friendly yet accessible ladder for frogs to jump onto and use. So thus, the coir mat frog ladder was born. 
We installed these ladders along agriculture waterways and regularly monitored and kept track of these ladders that we had installed. Now at first, we held these ladders down with rocks. But later, when we went back, we found that the water had actually washed away the rocks, as you can see here in the picture. And we were worried that the frogs might not be able to use the ladders that we had put in place if they weren't held down by rocks. But we actually found that the frogs could still use these ladders to escape or evacuate when in danger, even if these coir mat ladders weren't held down by rocks. So this was a special experience and it was a learning experience as well. And this was so rewarding. And we got to thinking about the endangered species in Yantan. We learned about endangered species such as the Seoul frog. We decided uh, to explore these endangered species in Yantan. This was our way of having fun and letting off steam, going into nature. For us, this was our getaway and this was our way of having fun. It was like play. The scenery was, was breathtaking and we were able to observe the soul frog in its natural habitat as an endangered species, and we contemplated on how we could help these soul frogs thrive without disturbances from human activities. And this wasn't a one-off observation. We went back again and again, and we also visited other habitats of the soul frog where in other areas the soul frog could be found. This is a close-up of the soul frog, and we were careful not to intrude on their habitat and make their lives more difficult during our explorations and expeditions. And as I said before, all of our members also joined Birds Korea. And Dr. Moo walked us through the basics of human, people, nature, geology, and especially the impact of human activity on nature. After we learned all about this, we started to go bird watching and on explorations. We took extreme care to minimize our footprint. We tiptoed around and made as little noise as possible during these expeditions in order to become one with nature. Now, during this course of our own transformation, all of these experiences opened our eyes to the extent of the damage that we humans cause on nature, the waste, the contamination, and so much more. Thus began our cleanup projects. Picking up trash for us was also a fun experience for us. All the members went together and every single moment was enjoyable. So now this is where another question popped into our minds. What about other areas besides Hantan River? What types of rocks lie beyond Hantan River? So we went on rock explorations. And one day, we heard about an industrial waste landfill that was going to be built in Yeoncheon. We began researching the potential impacts of a landfill and came across issues that raised red flags. That's how we decided to participate in the campaign against building this landfill in Yeoncheon. We also went on so many fun and memorable trips. We went on numerous geological explorations, including along the Civilian Control Line, or CCL, and we found different soil, rocks, and so much more everywhere we went. And once again, we had a blast, even during the cold in winter. Now, this picture you see is a large hole in the rock that we came across during our expeditions. So we thought this could be a dolmen and wondered what could potentially lie within. So we really felt like explorers and we learned so much. We also began to wonder 
what birds would feed on during the winter season. So what we did is we stocked up on rice during the summertime and put it out for the birds to eat during the cold winter season. This is us exploring the pillow lava during the winter season. Because when the water freezes over during the winter, this allows us to get a closer look at the pillow lava because we can walk across on the ice that is frozen over. And after some time of studying and exploring, we gained a better understanding about geology and ecology. So at this point, the Seoul Waldorf School contacted us requesting a field trip. And so for this field trip, we prepared lunch boxes filled with local food and delicacies and went together on an exploration of the Geo Park and shared with the students the knowledge that we had obtained. And once again, this tour was also exciting and fun. And after that, Yeoncheon was designated as a biosphere reserve, and so we started thinking uh, about how, since it's a biosphere reserve and also a global geopark, we started wondering about how we could share this achievement and this feat with city folk. That led to the production of Backpacking Through Yeoncheon, which is a promotional video that introduces the history of Yeoncheon Dolmen, street, the streets of Yeonton, and for example, uh, a lot more in an effort to promote Yeonton. This was uploaded on YouTube to uh, let more people know about what Yeonton has to offer. And we also got requests from returning farmers who wanted to know more about Yeonton, the place they had come back to. So. We hosted education sessions on biosphere reserves, and the return farmers also participated alongside us in cleaning up areas in Yeoncheon, including the Imjin River and Hantan River. We also hosted a session where we built eco ponds, and we also taught return farmers and rural return rural residents how to make EM soap in terms of preserving and protecting water supply. All of this was extremely rewarding and meaningful. And as you can see here, we also went on geopark tours. And as a geopark guide myself, I was able to guide them on these tours. We also came across open contests. This was the simultaneous monitoring of winter migratory birds across the river, along the river, hosted by the Korean Network for River and Watersheds. We observed migratory birds and compiled and submitted a list of birds that we had been able to see and observe. And we placed eight, which was amazing and so motivating. So much so that we actually went on to participate in the Summer Migratory Bird Observation Contest, where we won the Excellence Award. We also worked with the National Trust of Korea to observe cranes and also plant adlai to create feeding grounds for cranes by planting adlai. And this year round, uh, we built more frog ladders. Last year, as I told you before, we used choir mats. But this year, we wanted to go greener, which is why we used honeysuckle pots and dayflower pots. We weaved the vines together and dropped the ladder down for frogs to climb up on. But we found that the frogs actually found the ladders made out of the previous choir mats easier to use compared to the choirs com compared to the ladders that we had made out of vines. So we went back to using choir mats to make the ladders for frogs. 
Now, this is the slide about the simultaneous monitoring of summer migratory birds along the river I talked about earlier. And it was a rainy day. But we all went out together to compile this list you can see here of the birds that we had observed. And for those birds, we were not able to spot, but here, we also created another separate list and submitted it, which got us the excellence award as well. We even saw the gray frog hawk with binoculars we carried around and took pictures of different migratory birds along our journey. And we were so happy and it was so much fun. And so as I said before, we were completely new to nature, geoparks and biosphere reserves. But we were able to learn, which made us even more curious to learn more. And we wanted to share what we had learned with others around us. And this made our work so rewarding and fun. I can't stress enough how rewarding it is for us and how interesting and fun we find it. So we will continue to, to, to put our best foot forward this year and next year in 2022. We're going to continue our monitoring of winter cranes, plant adlai, monitor summer and winter migratory birds. And of course, of course, we're going to continue our work with frog ladders, but we're going to expand the target area for installation so that we can protect more soul frogs. We also discovered that there are a lot of invasive plants along rivers. Uh, we plan on learning more about these invasive species to protect the reed, silver grass, runner reed, a reed mace, and other indigenous species. And we plan on learning more, uh, getting education and training about these invasive species and also indigenous species. And what we plan on doing is obtaining the seeds in November of this year and plant them along the designated areas along the river so that we can observe them alongside uh, the indigenous, uh, the invasive species and the effect they have vis-a-vis -vis on invasive uh, species. We also plan on rolling out tour programs on IDAs, such as to parks next year. So that was a little bit about what we have in store, what we have planned and what we have done and some of our experiences that I wanted to share with you. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to introduce to you some of the projects we've had uh, so much fun working on. And I hope that more people can learn to live in tune with nature and the members of GeoEco Network will do our best to contribute to protecting and strengthening IDAs down the road. Thank you for listening to my presentation about my own amazing experience with global geoparks and biosphere reserves in Yantan. With that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you so much. Ms. Kwon, thank you very much for that interesting presentation and uh, a range of activities you have undertaken in both the Basque Reserve and the Geoparks. Now we are moving into a panel session uh, for question and answers from the panelists. But before I do that, there is a, uh, there is a survey conducted uh, uh, among the participants based on some questions on local community involvement in IDAs. And this is the result. Uh, which is now on the screen. Can everybody see the screen? Okay, now see these are, these are, this is more like a analysis of uh, keywords uh, which have been uh, picked up from your answers. And uh, as you can see, uh, the challenge, when you ask the question, what is the main challenge? What is being given as answers varies, anything from, policy stands out, 
but there are lots of other things. There are there are some items in Korean uh, or other languages which I cannot decipher. But as you can see, communication barrier, coordination, the benefit to the local, there are various issues. So uh, this, I, this, I think, is, uh, is an indication of how we need more in-depth studies in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this area of work uh, involving local communities in uh, IDAs. Uh, so uh, why don't I start with this? Uh, why don't I start uh, asking the three panelists, what do you think about what you see on the screen? If you can, each of you can make a brief comment on what is the main challenge in your view? <laughs> Who wants to go first? Be as brief as possible so that we can take uh, more questions. In fact, the secretariat has given me some one or two questions from from uh, the the people who are listening in. So, and I have sent some questions to you beforehand. You know those questions. So we'll we'll see whether we can get a cross section of them. So, but uh, now that these uh, this this slide is on the screen, what is the main challenge? Do you think? Uh, to increase involvement in the local communities? Quick answers, not long explanations. Uh, Who yes, wants uh, to go first? Uh, yes, uh, I can, I can yes, go first. Please, please. So, uh, first of all, I see uh, a, uh, a lot of uh, questions about uh, cooperation and communication as well. And I think uh, these are uh, two things that are uh, both very, very important when working with the community is that there has to be a constant level of communication, not just one way, not just from the uh, IDA to the local community, but it has to be in both directions, a sort of a, a two-way street of uh, communication. So I think that's very important. Good. Madam Chan, or Chen, do okay. you have any thoughts? Um, yes, To you have to find the local communities who share the same principles who understand the UNESCO principle and who share the same principles. You need some, some way to find the right um, communities who share the same principles, yeah, to support the ideas of Joe Park. And Ms. Kwon, do you have any thoughts? What is the main challenge? <laughs> I think, based on my experience in Yeoncheon, I think educating local residents is extremely important. And those local residents who gain this education, who get this training, need to learn to act voluntarily, to actually go out on their own and to create a virtuous cycle voluntarily on their own. So motivation, I think, is extremely important. And if this happens, I think everyone can become facilitators and partners and cooperators. So the collaboration between everyone to create this type of cycle is extremely important, in my opinion. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, that's, uh, that's a brief uh, cross-section of ideas from our three speakers. In fact, uh, one of the questions which was asked as part of the session uh, from Vietnam, uh, Mr. Nguyen Hong Tri, I think the Vietnam Map National Committee Secretary General, he asked the question, are there institutions, policies for local involvement in designated areas, geoparks in Hong Kong? Madam Chan? Okay, I, I don't know if he means the local communities mean um, the local villages in my PowerPoint, but uh, the no, 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 po no exact strict rules or policies. Um, but we follow the GGN the guidelines. So like bottom up approach, um, uh, try to benefit the local people, communication with them, let them understand the Jopa concept and support our work, um, try to benefit them. So. Uh, as I mentioned in our PowerPoint, uh, as far as practical and uh, feasible, we try to um, work with them or assist them in any ways. Good. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, uh, policies are important, but then policies are written documents. They have to be still implemented. <laughs> so I think that you know, I, I've been in international business for a long time, and. Uh, it's easy to write things, 
but to do things on a particular place in a particular uh, time involving particular sets of local people there is there is no rules about it you have to try it out there is, you know what is important is more experimentation and as madam chan said the policy people should learn from practice more rather than the other way around so this is where i think uh, the idas are a nice set globally for more experimentation locally i mean after all if you're going to talk about local communities in internationally designated areas you have to test to start from local people you know that's the starting point okay let me see whether i can pose a question to you which i had shared before it's regarding tourism visitation all of you talk about visitation now with the covid uh, episode uh, which uh, stopped the international travel at least and many countries even local travel how much were you affected did you have any did it did it have any major impact on your financial uh, resources coming in you know if you were too visitor dependent uh, try to be as brief as possible uh, because um, i don't know uh, the japanese site may may not have been very dependent on international visitor but the hong kong site seems to be expecting people to come from abroad i know because a lot of villages moved out so what do you think was the situation during covid and how is it recovering okay i i have to say no, go ahead uh, for hong kong japan the situation is different because mm -hmm. the hong kong people cannot travel to other places so they go to the countryside in Hong Kong, including the Jiupa. So we, we receive a lot of visitors, local visitors from Hong Kong. And that creates quite some problems, actually, <laughs> like rubbish or... Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit different. So um, people don't wear masks. So that's why we have to put up banners in a Joe Park advising the visitors to wear masks and also like to protect the environment, bring their little home etc so uh, a bit dif um, um, different uh, for the situation in hong kong but maybe i think in uh, some other drill parks they face the same problems because in hong kong drill park we cannot limit people um not to not to go to our drill park yeah okay madam kwan uh, uh, yes, thank you for the question. The Biosphere Reserve and the Hantan um, Global Geopark were designated in 2019 and 2020. So one of them were designated during the COVID-19 pandemic because it was in 2020 after the pandemic erupted. So. For us, in trying to promote and market the Global Geopark and Biosphere Reserve was quite a challenge because we didn't have an ex I have the experience of trying to promote these areas without COVID. So we didn't have a pre-COVID experience for us. And because we uh, have our managing uh, authorities in the metropolitan area because we are located only about 90 minutes away from the metropolitan city we are subject to more stringent policies and regulations here in yonchon and we've also seen a significant drop uh, in visitors in general you know restaurants closed down and especially for our uh, geo food as well we experienced uh, very little foot traffic so regarding these uh, management organizations for example there were a lot of events that were held before um, COVID-19 broke out so for us there was a very direct impact we were very hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic to be honest and the drain waterfall is actually a really uh, popular site but after COVID-19 broke out you know the restaurants couldn't be filled up with people people couldn't gather in large numbers and people couldn't gather to eat you know so the 
a number of tourists didn't drop too much, but the activities that we could carry out were quite restricted. So we had our hands tied in terms of what we could do and really branch out and experience. And moving forward, in post-COVID or before post-COVID, we now call what we're going to be living through in the very near future with COVID. So in terms of that, I believe that these types of remote or virtual tourism and online tourism is going to be another venue, another route for us that we can experience um, and with. And I hope that during the second half of this year, things are going to be uh, improving soon and so we look forward to things getting a little bit better we all hope that we all hope that <laughs> and uh, brown uh, theodore what, what are you what are your feelings uh yes so um in itoigawa we've uh, obviously uh experienced uh, thankfully our uh, region has not experienced many uh covid-19 cases ourselves but uh because of the uh you know, the worldwide pandemic and the stop of travel, uh, we've seen um, a, a complete collapse of our uh, inbound, our uh, foreign tourism. Uh, we had actually had some very large successes in foreign tourism, but now our numbers are zero at this point for foreign tourism because nobody can get into the country. Uh, but uh, we also have seen um, less uh, tourists in general uh, because of various lockdowns in uh, the uh, Tokyo and the major metropolitan regions. But um, on the flip side of that, we have actually seen, while our uh, main museum facilities have seen about maybe half the regular visitor numbers we usually have, we have had over double the number of school field trips uh, to our geopark since previous years. And this is because previously our school field trip uh, marketing had mostly focused on the major urban centers, Tokyo and Osaka. And so this uh, the uh, COVID pandemic has forced us to switch our focus to uh, local and uh, regional schools uh, within the neighboring areas. And so these schools, which normally would be going on school field trips to the urban centers, have now started bringing their school field trips here to the geopark. And so we've been able to sort of um, mitigate sort of some of the worst aspects of COVID uh, through that strategy. That's interesting that uh, because of the drop in influx from distant places like Tokyo, you mm -hmm. shifted to local and regional schools and uh, mm -hmm. found a new set of uh, uh, visitors maybe for the future. Yes, so we're hoping some of these schools won't just immediately drop us and go back to Tokyo after <laughs> COVID. We're hoping some of them will maybe decide that, you know, they enjoyed visiting our geopark enough that they would like to continue visiting us in the future. So hopefully- you have to You have to be creative to keep their attention on you for a longer period of time. Yes. Now there's a question from Vogue Village site. In, uh, the question was, uh, where land is scarce in countries where land is scarce, I mean, Hong Kong land is scarce. Uh, can you please advise how to create a balance between preservation and development? Uh, that's a very big question. But, uh, you know, in terms of educational policy, you know, in terms of it, uh, the question also refers to geopark educational policy, in terms of conservation development relationship. What I mean, it's a general question because uh, in different, for example, in geoparks uh, in Japan, uh, Theodore mentioned the geological feature, which is a tectonic line separating Western and Eastern parts. Uh, in Hong Kong, it's more older structures and geological heritage. Uh, which people come to relate to, and in uh, in uh, in uh, the Korean side, it's more related to rivers. So there are differences. So how do you? And then then the Korean side also includes biosphere reserves, which gives other possibilities to relate to biodiversity, birds, and so on. So a general idea about conservation development relationship, and this is something I'm thinking that GCDA will follow up for the future in terms of local community idea, idea relationship. 
uh, each of you maybe can say a few words in terms of what you think, because we are going to run short of time and we may not have uh, too much time for too many questions. Brown, why don't you go first? Okay, so it's a very, it's a very big question. <laughs> so, and maybe a little it's bit. Not a, it's, it's, it's not a question. It's just to get some thoughts from you. Just, don't take it as a question. Any, um, any general ideas you may have. So, so sort of um, about the sort of the balance uh, we have here in within our geopark between conservation and development. I was actually when uh, listening to your uh, presentation, uh, Dr. Uh, Ishwaram, um, uh, Dr. Natarajan. Uh, so we, uh, um, you talked about the sort of echo part, this uh, echo city in uh, Wudalanchi, where they're moving people out of the sort of the sensitive uh, areas, the conservation areas into a uh, sort of a new town. And uh, this is actually sort of the opposite problem that we have here in Itoigawa, where we're actually trying to encourage people to move back into our conservation areas, into uh, these uh, small mountain communities that we have located near our geosites, uh, because uh, many of these uh, communities are uh, uh, very elderly and very depopulated, and many of them on their own have been moving over the years down to the uh, lower valleys and to the coast where there are more jobs available. But because of that, uh, we don't have sort of the manpower anymore within these um, conservation areas of local community members who are uh, invested in the region. And so we've been trying to push actually um, not just conservation in these regions, but also uh, sustainable development so that we can have these uh, sustainable communities within uh, these individual regions. That's it's right. sort of my, just a thought I have. Yeah, you know, each situation is different, I guess. Ms. Kwan, uh, you have any thoughts? Sorry about that. Well, for us, the Biosphere Reserve and the Global Geo Park accreditation were huge for us, of course, as it is across the world, but that led to a peak in people's interest and attention here. After this designation, that was government led by the government. The local residents and communities really were educated so much more about these biosphere reserves and global geo parks and what they had to offer. And they are much more aware of what needs to go into the development of these areas and regions as well. Since it's located near the DMZ or uh, borders the DMZ, the CCL or the civilian control line is actually moved more northward. So we learned about this and we thought if the CCL moves up, then what about the well-preserved environments and ecosystems? They probably would be contaminated and polluted. So that was why a lot of residents were actually opposed to and campaigned against the civilian control line moving upwards. Now, the COVID-19 drove home the importance of environment as well, conservation and, and utilizing well the resources that we have at hand. So the heightened awareness about this to me, I think, is a very positive sign. That's good. Madam Chen. Okay. Okay. I would say um, this is a very big question. Okay. Scientifically, because I work in the conservation department. So scientifically, I, we have a standpoint if some, what is um, ecologically important or biologically important. But I think it's important um, the whole society have a consensus. <laughs> Something yes. that the whole society have to decide what is important, whether land for housing is important or this piece of wetland is important. So we need a consensus. And I would say it's important to educate the people, at least to let them know the importance of these um, uh, habitats or wildlife. But then the whole society have to decide what is more important, I would say. But education and yes, awareness is important also. At least and we need to let the public know the value of these habitats and then let's decide together. 
Okay, great. I think those are general reflections which are very useful and it shows the diversity of situations also. You cannot, uh, you know, global agendas, whether that is sustainable development or climate change or mitigation and adaptation, they say but uh, the extent to which they can be adapted to a particular situation locally in a particular place in a particular time, that requires more experimentation and learning rather than teaching or uh, advocating a lot of uh, learning through practice has to become a kind of a major emphasis of local community involvement in the management of IDAs and that is some area I hope GCDA can give us some leadership with regard to research training developing case studies and similar kinds of uh, activities now my part of the world, which is France, Paris, is two minutes to 10 o'clock. Um, I guess this was supposed to go on till 10 o'clock. Uh, are we on time to finish or can we go on some more? Sandy or Madam, Madam Ern Young? But you have five more minutes ish. Okay, I have five more minutes. Very good. Then I post one quick question to the three of you. In terms of your educational materials, and all three sites include geoparks. Now, I'm going to focus on geoparks. It's, geology is much more difficult. I'm currently involved in a job dealing with geology. So geology is much more difficult to explain to people and attract their interest because it's everything about past, rocks, and geological histories. So, how much of your educational materials deal with specifically with geology and the specific geological interests of the site compared to more general nature and birds and beasts and so on? Geology is something very specific. Brown. Okay. Sorry, it's it's five o'clock now, so we have a chime going off. <laughs> <laughs> but. So uh, maybe you can go to someone uh, else uh, first while this plays. Okay, Madam Chan. Um, I would say, um, yeah, somehow, sometimes um, geology is, yeah, it's a bit difficult, but at least uh, you have to find out the interesting parts of your, your geopark. And then we try to make it into a story. It's more like storytelling, the, the method that we use and we have a kind of guideline that we have to explain it as a something, uh, we have to explain it to a 12 year old um, youngster or kid. So we try to make everything um, easy, easy to understand and like a story. We have a mind that we have to explain it to a 12 year old person, not to a sci uh, sci scientist. Yes, this is our- okay. Good point. In fact, when I joined UNESCO and started doing world heritage we used to say how do you explain world heritage to your mom you know <laughs> yeah, like to your kid if you're a kid <laughs> youngster how to explain it to your kid or your mother okay um brown are you ready now yes yes the chime is finished sorry <laughs> so uh but uh anamsan has a, a very uh, excellent point so in geoparks we often talk about the uh, the geo stories that uh, we have to tell uh, with our uh, local uh, geological heritage. And so, for example, um, in Itoigawa Geopark, uh, we're very fortunate to have this uh, culture of this history of being the world's oldest uh, jade working culture in the world. So for 7,000 years, uh, since 7,000 years ago, people in Itoigawa have been crafting beads made out of um, jade. And so we can take a look at this jade, which everybody knows and is a very accessible, it's, it's a beautiful gemstone, uh, so everybody can understand its value as geological material. And we can look at it and we can say about, why is there this beautiful stone in Itoigawa? And why is it not anywhere else in Japan? So why do we have this gemstone? And then we can connect that to this Itoigawa Shizuoka tectonic line, this massive uh, boundary between the North American and Eurasian continental plates, and we can show how this uh, jade only forms deep underground 
at these uh, plate boundary zones. And so we can connect these stories together to sort of make it a little bit more interesting and easier to understand uh, for the uh, average person. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. Ms. Kwon? OK. The Hantan Global Geopark, the Hantan River Global Geopark, is blessed with beautiful scenery. And we border North Korea as well. We have three uh, Taiwan, Pocheon, and Yeonton local municipalities located in the Yeonton district. Uh, located around the Yontan district that uh, is located around the Hantan River that borders the Hantan River. So that means that the people who come visit uh, are actually awed by the beauty of the scenery. And when they are awed by that scenery, uh, the local residents are extremely proud of what they have to offer and because they because we have breathtaking scenery we explain the geology behind it while they are staring in awe at the scenery so that's a good uh, positive point for us because it's uh, really it piques their interest to begin with because it's so beautiful and we also as uh, Ms. Yunnan Chan said uh, we also try to explain it as if we're talking to a 12 year old and we we also try to raise questions. Where do you think this lava came from, for example? And we aren't able to go to North Korea now. We can't freely go to and from North Korea. And we tell them how this lava flew, uh, flo flowed here from North Korea. And then people are really interested because it's something about a country that they've never been to that we don't know of, and it's lava from North Korea. And so when we try to provide information and uh, guide people on tours of geoparks here in Hantan River, we try to make it as fun as possible. Great. Very good. Very good. So I think we are now on time uh, for concluding. Um, I Before I hand over to Ms. Kim uh, from the UNESCO National Commission, i like to, on my side, uh, thank the panelists for providing some interesting insights into the questions posed. I'd like to thank all those people who participated in the discussion column here. There are lots of inputs. I couldn't even keep track of all of them. So it's hopefully been an interesting session. And I myself uh, enjoyed being here. And I hope uh, that GCDA now that it's going to be formally opened by 2022 will do some uh, creative and interesting uh, international cooperation activities in this particular theme, involvement of local communities, internationally designated areas, and we can all participate and contribute towards it. So thank you, and uh, everybody uh, from my side, uh, have a good day, wherever you are, whatever your time zone you are in. And I'm going to pass it on to Madam Kim for her final words. Thank you. Thank you from the organizer. Thank you, Ish, for chairing this interesting discussion. Uh, please. <laughs> uh, and uh, thank, thank you to all the uh, panelists and participants who joined uh, today. Uh, I think it uh, was very fruitful and very exciting discussions. Thank you very much. And now, this is the end of the first day of the seminar. Uh, tomorrow's session will begin at uh, 3 p.m. Seoul time, uh, just like today. The topic of, for tomorrow will be uh, communication strategies for internationally designated areas. We strongly encourage you to come back for uh, many more insightful presentations and further discussions. Thank you, and see you tomorrow.